Hello, my name is Nigel Palmer, and I'm the author of the book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments. And today we're going to be talking about foliar spraying. And I have my friend Hugh Richards on the line here with me to help with the discussion. Absolutely. Um, so for me, uh, basically, as an avid fan of your work, your book and your workshop, um, you kind of uh, changed my mind on, I had this weird perception about foliar sprays because I had always seen it used in the wrong ways. So either pesticides, herbicides, or particular type of um, nutrients and minerals that are, are extracted from very uh, exploitive methods. So what I found out was that there's actually a good way of doing foliar sprays. And I think it would be really nice to kind of ask questions um, so other people can find out the benefits of foliar sprays. And uh, the really exciting thing is that not only can they help the plant, but equally they can help the soil life, um, which is just absolutely amazing. So let's start right at the basics. What is your definition um, of a foliar spray? Ah, foliar spray is something that you mix with rainwater that has either a mineral or a biological content to it that can be used to nurture the plant or the soil. Brilliant. Now I want to kind of break this apart. So the first thing you mentioned was rainwater. Uh, why can't I just use uh, water from my tap? Why do you recommend using the rain? Well, so if we're talking about quality of water, which is a lifelong study, um, I think you could spend your entire life talking about water and not be bored. Rainwater is the best source of water because it's essentially created up above. It condenses up above and falls down. So it's, it's clean. It doesn't have carbonates or bicarbonates or, or any other compounds in it. Whereas water from a spring might, water from a, a well might or a stream. And of course, of course, water from a tap, if it's from a municipal source may have all kinds of crazy things in it that um, probably is not too good for uh, a plant or yourself necessarily. Brilliant. So that is really simple uh, rule for us. When possible, use rainwater because we can get the best results. So you mentioned minerals and we're very used to, even if we're going to a garden center and we see it plastered, all these things that we could spray on our plants, whether they're minerals or some kinds of f fungicides and herbicides. What was really interesting was that you mentioned biological ones as well. So what, what is a biological foliar spray? Yeah, or a biological drench. Uh, well, we are saturated in biology. Our skin is saturated with biology. We have all over our body, all over the plant, the leaf, the stem, the soil. Biology is everywhere. And we need to understand and harness this biology. The best source of biology is leaf mold biology, which you can find in your local woods for free. This is absolutely loaded with archaea, fungi, and bacteria, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these things, and they're all local. They're not shipped in from some other part of the world. They're not dormant. They are living and available. And so this is just a tremendous source that can be used to change the soil. Literally, you can change the soil. If, if you have stodgy soil that uh, has a, a mulch on it, for instance, that's been sitting there for a long time, by adding biology to it, you will immediately start to digest this and change its, its composition. So this is why the, biology, the biological amendments are so important. There's no such thing as good or bad biology. There's no such thing as good or bad bacteria or fungus. It's all about balance. And when you have a huge diverse population of these things, they're going to keep themselves balanced and in check. I think that's absolutely amazing because what I found is that the recipes are dead simple. Uh, you don't, you have a handful of leaf mold and you have a boiled potato and you have some rainwater and a little bit of uh, salt and you make yourself these amazing things. Another one is LAB as well, which I've made um, and used. So, so that is really cool to see that rather than just thinking of sprays as just being ways to add um, minerals, but also ways to add biology as well. And it's a whole thing, I think, that especially in the home growers um, kind of uh, area of, of the world, 
um, has has kind of been forgotten or, or never even realized. And, and I think that the great thing about your book is that it's empowering us home growers to have methods to deal with these issues. Whereas before we used to think we might have been uh, fighting losing battles with things like powdery mildew or rust or particular pests, there's, there's ways about it and you're just using natural things. So that is really exciting. Now, what are some, um, in terms of a foliar spray now thinking about the minerals, what are some kind of amendments that you feature in your book um, or, you know, other kind of Korean natural farming methods? What kind of um, amendments can we apply to our plants as a foliar spray that we can make ourselves? The easiest ones are vinegar extractions or uh, fermented plant juices. Those are the two simple ones. Uh, you can actually be as simple as just taking weeds, plants, and put them in a bucket of water and you can use those immediately. The biology that's on the surface of those plants will be suspended in the water. And so you now have an extremely inexpensive biological amendment that you can apply to, uh, immediately. So those are the three simplest ones. And then you can use your imagination using IMO4 or fermented fish uh, and, and some of the other things that are out there or, or leaf mold fermentations as well. So all of these things offer opportunities for uh, both foliar sprays and drenches. And what I really love is that all of these recipes, they kind of, they, they give you a, a, a format or a formula, but then you can, you have so much choice when it comes to what you actually want to do, such as vinegar extractions. There's so many different things that you can extract minerals from or fermented plant juices. You can go uh, anywhere from kind of, old fruit that you might get from your green grocers to grass to nettles um and i think that's great as well because as you mentioned on um in in many places the importance of closing the waste gap um yeah. and i think that's really special i think the other reason that this is so important is because for me in new england i have lots of resources available to me um, and i think you may have a lot of resources available to you in wales but there are places in, on earth that don't have all of the resources. They may not have the lush greenery. Uh, for yeah. And what's empowering about these recipes is these recipes allow whatever you do have to be utilized. And this is what's so important and so empowering is getting these recipes to people so that they learn to look around to see what they do have and what they can utilize to feed their plants going forward. Brilliant how does a plant actually utilize these minerals like does it does it go through the leaves yes it, well it could go through the leaves or the soil um, a foliar spraying the leaves allows minerals to be absorbed by the leaves and distributed within the plant through the phloem pathway which is a a, a really nice pathway because it's two-way and it goes to the, all of the sinks of the plant it's going to go to the flower the fruit the new shoots and the roots uh, and the root exudates. So it's actually feeding the soil biology as well. So foliar spraying the leaves is a great idea. You can actually foliar spray the bark of a tree when there's no leaves on it as well. There's a, about 15, 20% will be absorbed through the bark. And it's just like human beings absorbing things through the skin. I like to foliar spray in early spring when uh, things are just coming alive so that I can give those trees, those fruit trees and, and berries the nutrition they need early on in the growing season. And then, of course, there's drenching where you literally just put this right into the water and it's allowed to absorb into the soil solution and then absorbed up through the roots and the xylem pathway. What's the benefit of just applying it as a foliar spray to the plant rather than applying it uh, as a drench to the roots? Right. So when you apply uh, something to the roots, that has to be absorbed by the soil solution, and then it has to be maybe digested by the biology, and then it has to be absorbed through the root system. So it takes a lot of time for these drenches to actually get into the plant through the xylem pathway. Whereas a foliar spray can be applied directly to the leaf and absorbed within minutes or hours of that application. So you can, you can affect the health and, uh, of the plant immediately literally almost immediately by using foliar sprays. I, th I think that's amazing. And one of the, the big moments for me, um, reading a book and taking your course was actually realizing 
the plants, send some of their sugars from photosynthesis out of their roots as, as root exudates to feed the soil biology. What I always thought, and this is perhaps because I didn't question it enough, was that we can only start from the soil to improve the plant. But actually plants can work in kind of that circular um, way of also being able to improve the soil yeah. simultaneously. Yeah, I think it becomes extremely empowering and eye-opening to recognize how much of the energy produced in photosynthesis the plant actually feeds to the soil. And in nature, when plants, when anything is giving up energy to facilitate something else, there's a darn good reason for it. And for the case for plants, they actually are feeding the soil biology in exchange for complex compounds that will come back to them through that soil biology. Uh, the, the fungi, mycelium extends the reach for water and nutrients, um, as well as the, bio, the bacteria and archaea in the soil as well. So this amazing symbiotic relationship between the soil ecology and the plant itself is something that I think has been overlooked by many people for a very long time. And you mentioned photosynthesis. Photos photosynthesis efficiency is extremely important. And by providing a broad spectrum foliar spray, you can actually apply to the, to the plant in real time the minerals that it needs to increase its photosynthesis efficiency, the magnesium, the, the iron, the manganese, and the phosphorus that are actually in those broad spectrum mineral amendments that can um, actually increase photosynthesis efficiency. So this is another thing that I don't think home gardeners might think about a lot is, okay, I know the plant is creating all of this stuff through photosynthesis, but boy, I wonder if it could do it better. Boy, I wonder what it's doing now. What is the percentage of efficiency that my plants are engaged in today? And how do I improve that? And so here's another idea of how we can really affect something using something that we make in our backyard for just about free that can have a significant impact on the plant and soil ecology health. And the other thing is when we increase photosynthesis efficiency, we're not only giving food to the soil, we're giving carbon to the soil, and this is carbon sequestration. This is how we're going to get carbon back into the soil through these ideas of agriculture and efficient photosynthesis. I just, I just love it because it's like, rather than it being this one-way system, it, it's more of a circular regenerative system. And it's kind of the, the whole idea behind, or part of the idea behind that way of either regenerative agriculture or regenerative gardening, being able to look at the whole system um, rather than just singular systems and how everything works together. And, and obviously, like if the photosynthesis efficiency increases, the plant has access to more nutrients, you're going to grow um, better crops, perhaps more nutrient dense, they're going to end up being tastier. So it's kind of a no brainer um, for a gardener to do that. If, if nature has given us a way to do that, then we might as well make the most of it because it's there and it's only helping everything. Yeah, I, I'd love when I learn these things, even relearn these things, I, I'm always taken back how intuitive these ideas are and how much they make sense and, and why why, why isn't this the mainstream? Why don't we, why does it take so much effort to learn these things? Why, why aren't all the textbooks in, in universities espousing these points of view so that we, we can all jump on this amazing um, uh, journey of, of health and well being for our soil and ecosystem? Well, good thing you've come along then. <laughs> no pressure, Nigel. It's all down to you. It's all down to you. Um, so I guess to kind of start wrapping up in terms of um, foliar sprays, there's a couple more things I want to look at. How regular should we do, be doing it? And sh should we have quite high concentrations of whatever we're spraying or should it be diluted? Yeah. Um, the first thing is uh, dilution rates of 500 to 1 or even 1,000 to 1 are recommended. And... I think that experimentation is the best way to determine what works. And there's a whole bunch of ways you can evaluate this that we can talk about some other day. Um, so as far as ratios, yeah, 500 to one. And uh, forgive me for the US standard of measurement, but if I had a five gallon bucket, I put about four gallons of water in that. 
and one tablespoon of uh, mineral amendment is about 1,000 to one. So if I had two tablespoons in that five gallon bucket with four gallons of water in it, it would be 500 to one. Plants begin to rely on us when we feed them. An example is when we put nitrogen on our gardens or fields, the plant recognizes that there's nitrogen in the soil and it's in a form that's available to them. So they no longer create the symbiotic relationship with uh, nitrogen fixing biology in the soil. And that's fine and well, as long as people are still giving them that nitrogen. But as soon as that nitrogen supply ends, then the plant doesn't get any nitrogen and hasn't facilitated those relationships and things go south quickly. And you can see that in a lot of crops. You can see some people's lawns, for instance, where they put all the nitrogen in in spring, thinking everything's cool. And then all of a sudden everything turns brown, for instance. Um, well, when you're foliar spraying, you're doing the same kind of thing. So what I like to do is I like to use smaller proportions, uh, uh, starting off with the 1,000 to 1 or 500 to 1. And I do it on a regular basis. I might do it once a week um, because most people live on a seven day schedule and they can actually go out there on a Saturday morning, for instance, or whenever their day off is, and they can apply a foliar spray. But it's wise to make sure you do that throughout the entire growing season because the plant is gonna become dependent on those amendments that you're providing, those minerals that you're providing. You can also do it at 10 days, two weeks. You can do whatever you think you want to do, but the key is to be, is to be consistent in, in what you do. Um, I, I'm just gonna jump in and just one thing that I think is important to mention is unlike what you'd buy from a store, it might only have one, two or three nutrients. So it's excessive rather than what you create um, very often it is broad spectrum. So it's just a totally different game. Yeah, that's totally true. Because, because of the broad spectrum, because you're getting all the minerals that, you, that a plant needs in these foliar sprays, um, you're, you're, it is an entirely different ball game compared to uh, buying that package of NPK, for instance. Uh, yeah, and, and you're less likely then to suffer from like really old deficiencies. We're like, I've, I've added so much nitrogen, but it's not growing properly. Yeah. We forget about the little guys that play such an important role. And, you know, the other thing about these, these ideas is that if you've been adding NPK to your soil for a long period of time and you go do a soil test, the probability is that you have excesses of P and K. And so you can actually save money by not doing that anymore. And this is the value of a soil test. When you go out and try and do something in your garden, um, it, it's very similar to having a bow and arrow in the middle of a field. Well, which way do you shoot, right? And this goes along with the whole idea of having a model. You need some sort of plant model, some framework with which to utilize to determine and make decisions that you're gonna go forward with. So I know I need to do something to my soil. Well, what am I gonna do? Well, the first thing you might wanna do is do a soil test so you understand what your deficiencies and your excesses are. Now, when you're in the middle of that field with a bow and arrow, you can see the barn over on the other side of the field, you have a place to shoot. Okay, I, can't, I shouldn't add any more NPK. I'm gonna save money and I don't have to go to the store. And now I can use the time that I was gonna spend going to the store to make mineral and biological amendments at home. That's brilliant. And uh, I have to say, it's very satisfying going around with a pump and just kind of, I almost see it as like spraying kind of gold dust over my plants now, um, because I know of all the completely natural um, goodness. And to me, intuitively as well, it, it makes total sense. So I guess if the final question is, we've covered all the main points, kind of the benefits, the types of foliar sprays, um, applying it. Um, but the, the final question is, when is the optimum time of day to apply a foliar spray? And I'm a poet now. <laughs> Did you get that right? Day you, know, spray? You, you, you are becoming an expert at asking me the right question. Trying to. <laughs> You're doing a really good job. Um, foliar spray, spraying is the act of putting a, a mist, a fine mist on the surface of the leaf. And so you want that mist to last on the leaf as long as possible. So if you were to provide that at the heat of the day, two o'clock on a sunny afternoon, when that 
plant is transpiring and all the moisture is coming right out of the root system through the plant and into the atmosphere, and that plant leaf is really hot, that foliar spray is not going to last long on that leaf at all. And it's just going to dissipate, dissipate and evaporate. But first thing in the morning before the sun comes up, the dew is on the leaf and everything is nice and moist and it's going to stay that way for some time. So a foliar spraying before the sun comes up in the morning is, is the best time to foliar spray your plant. It'll last on the leaf for as long as it can and so it has a better chance to absorb into the leaf structure. You can also do this to, at the end of the day, but you want to be cognizant of the amount of time the leaf is wet. Wet leaves are going to have a better opportunity to facilitate the growth of bacteria and fungus on that leaf surface. The other thing is that the efficiency of absorption increases when you foliar spray during humid times. So if you happen to be in a, 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 a moist, foggy day, that's a great time to foliar spray because the leaf surface is wet, you're applying that foliar spray to that leaf surface and it's gonna sit there for a long period of time. Um, whereas if it's been raining for three days and um, it's the end of the day, that's probably not a good time to foliar spray your plant. Brilliant. Now, Nigel, this is your channel. Um, I just want you to tell us where can we find out more about this and have you got any workshops uh, coming up that people can, can join online? Yeah. So um, I now have a website. It's called nigel-palmer.com and it lists uh, a bunch of things on there that you can, uh, that might be helpful to you. And I also am listing on there a workshop that I'm about to start. This is a, 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 another series coming up starting on April 24th. The first series was just so successful. I had such positive response from people that uh, um, I felt it was really important to try and get one more in uh, this season. So that's coming up. And if you go to nigel-palmer.com and you look at the workshop, you can read some of the comments that uh, people wrote about the workshop. Uh, the nice thing about it is, although it's uh, some fairly uh, um, interesting and a and, and lot of breadth, even the novice found that the program was very useful for them because it's explained in terms that is, is entirely digestible. And of course, if you have the book, the book can help to facilitate those ideas after you're finished with the workshop. The other thing is I do have uh, a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> okay. that, that's fine for now. And I'll just jump in and say, um, I'm just going to jump in and say, uh, now, if someone is watching this and it's past April the 24th um, on your website, I believe you'll then put a waiting list. Is that right? Yes, that's true. We'll have a waiting list so that we can um, uh, determine when to put it out again based on interest from um, everybody out there. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. And thank you, Hugh, for joining me and, and helping me answer questions. I really yeah. appreciate your help. And uh, for anybody who has any questions, you can contact me on nigel-palmer.com. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you soon. And I hope you find this interesting, useful, and a way of life that you're willing and interested in embracing.